Shalom, brothers and sisters. For this Thursday's thought, I want to talk to you guys about a number of different things. I had an idea of something I want to talk about. I was praying about it this morning, and I saw something, and I felt really impressed by the Spirit to see if I could kind of mix all that together into one Thursday thought that isn't too long. Because as you guys know, I can ramble a bit. I'm calling this the parable of the restaurant, and the reason why is because this morning I saw this, and it was really kind of on track with what I wanted to talk about. It says, this is a, um, a comment someone put on social media, or a post someone put on social media, and then the, the responding comment. It says, I find atheists confusing. It's like going to a restaurant and believing there's no cook in the back. And then a person responds, it's like going to the restaurant and ordering food, but the food doesn't come. And the waiter tells you to keep ordering because the cook will hear you and your order will come. But it's been hours and your food still hasn't shown up. And the waiter tells you you're not ordering hard enough. And also, sometimes that waiter is inappropriate with your kids. Now, as you know, the big focus of the fellowship right now is moving from the church. This idea of you've got to join this one particular organization the creeds, the dogmas of men, into the kingdom. And I find that this really speaks volumes to this idea. And the reason why is because in churches, we say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to go with, with Mormonism. The Community of Christ, when it was called the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints out in Utah, and I know there's other branches of our shared faith that will take a book of mormon and give it to you and community christ by the way doesn't do this anymore because they don't they don't really proselytize like they used to but they'll take a book of mormon put it in someone's hand and say read this now pray on it now because you know it's true you have to know that our church is true everything we have is correct and everyone else is wrong and then when it comes out that you know there's other churches of the book of mormon it's like well they don't really have it or they just use it for their own nefarious purposes and what have you and whatnot. But really, this doesn't work. Because if you have someone that's coming to Christ and you, you, you can't meet them where they are, God still can't. And when God meets them where they are, that means they may fit somewhere else. And that's where this comes in with the uh, Church of the Kingdom. But what does it have to do with this particular meme that I just read? I, as you know, am not a proponent of the prosperity gospel. I do not believe that the more wealth you have, the more money that you have, the more that God loves you. I, I think that's a ridiculous idea. I understand there's certain things in the Bible people cherry pick to, in the Book of Mormon as well, for the Latter-day Saint movement, and, and the Doctrine and Covenants, to express these ideas. But when you really get down to what Jesus taught, it, it really doesn't work. What does work is the reality that every single person in every book of scriptures meets God in a different and unique way. And so because of that, when we try to put a formula together that doesn't work, it's exactly what is talked about here. You're going into a, a restaurant and you say, hey, I want a grilled cheese sandwich and tomato soup. And the waiter says, well, you've got to want it really, really bad. You got to keep wanting, wanting it. You've got to keep wanting it, and you know you assume that there's a, a, a chef, a cook, someone in the back that does that, but maybe that's not on the menu. Maybe they don't have grilled cheese and tomato soup. Now, obviously, God has all things, but that doesn't mean that every church offers all things, right? For example, let's look at the LGBTQ community. God loves everyone and welcomes them, but there's a lot of churches on the earth right now. That doesn't put that reality on their menu. What do you do? At the same time, there's people who have a lot of heavy burdens financially. They need, they need help financially. But not all churches have a lot of money. What are you going to do? So the Lord's going to send us where we're needed and where we can find God, where we'll, where we'll find Him. So... Imagine you're going to a restaurant and you're ordering your grilled cheese and your tomato soup and the restaurant just point blank says, hey, look, we, we don't have this. It, it's just 
As you can see our menu, it's not something we offer, I'm sorry. Now, there's two things that can happen here. They can say, you need to repent, because if it's not on our menu, it isn't right. Or they can say, listen, there's a church down the road, I'm sorry, there's a restaurant down the road, let's keep with the analogy here, and they, they offer grilled cheese and tomato soup. Um, unfortunately, it just isn't something that the people that come here like or enjoy or want, but if that's what you're looking for, go to that restaurant down the street. Now, let's say you go to the restaurant down the street, and they say, hey, yeah, we've got it. And again, you order, and you believe so hard, but it doesn't. the order doesn't come. Again, this is the prosperity gospel. We're not looking for what the Lord wants. We're looking for what we want. We're looking for what we think that we need. Now, that's not to say that we don't need the things that we think that we need. In the Book of Mormon, it says over and over again that we're supposed to, if we take care of the poor, we're supposed to meet their wants and their needs. So that's that goes beyond just need. You know, it's like the difference between a, a living wage and a thriving wage. You can give me enough money to where I can work paycheck to paycheck, live paycheck to paycheck, but if I have a thriving wage, then I can actually get ahead in the world. It's the same thing spiritually. So maybe you go to a church and, and they offer the, or a restaurant, however you want to say it, sticking with the analogy, they don't, or they do offer the grilled cheese and tomato soup, but it just doesn't come. Well, time to try again. Have you gone to the Lord and asked the Lord which restaurant you're supposed to go to? Uh, the one of the reasons why I, I really like this, why it really spoke to me, is because several years ago I had a dream that I opened a, a store in a mall. And everyone kept going to all the different stores and saying, hey, you're wrong. You know, a bad thing's coming. And when it comes, if you're not in our store, you're not going to have the products you need and, and it's going to be bad for you. And in my dream, there was a, a, a manager from another store telling me in my store that I needed to close that store and get to his store because my store just wasn't good enough and it wasn't going to suffice. And all of a sudden, this meteor comes flying us, meteor shower. And I just look up and see it and just stare at it as it's falling at us. And he's just like ducking like this because he realized he got caught outside of his store. Well, it smashes all around, but the mall is left unharmed. And the man suddenly realizes it didn't matter what store he was in. It didn't matter that he wasn't in his store because we were all in the mall, the same building. And I want to testify to you that if you want to use this restaurant analogy, it's the same way. Just because you walk into a church and they don't have the, sticking with my analogy here, tomato soup and grilled cheese, that doesn't mean that they're false, they're wrong, they're apostates or anything like that. It just means that the Lord set them up for a very specific task. When you go out to eat, very rarely you're going to find a really good restaurant that serves hamburgers, pizza, Chinese food, Tex-Mex. You know, Indian cuisine, whatever. Because when you try to do too much, you're going to have to have a really big restaurant with lots of different things, lots of different chefs in there that are experts at each thing. So restaurants generally specialize. And that's what churches do too. Churches specialize. As a kingdom, we can be like that great big food plaza, a big, a big mall like in my dream that the Lord gave me where people can go where they need to be, and instead of pointing fingers at people, we can all work as one in Christ. Now, and we're at nine minutes, and I still really haven't gotten to the topic that I really wanted to talk about that really led me to all this. And so I definitely want to get into that, and hopefully it won't be more than another four or five minutes. I received a message last week from a sister Asking about this, uh, uh, the Brighamites would call it an anti-Mormon text. Um, it's called um, a letter to my wife, I believe. Let me double check that real quick. Yeah, a letter to my wife is what it's called. And she asked me what I thought. And before even getting into any of the, uh, you know, anti-Mormon rhetoric, if you will. In this letter, I, I want to read to you part of it here. He says, 
My dearest sweetheart, I love you with all my heart. This letter comes after months of heart-wrenching prayers to Heavenly Father for answers regarding the truthfulness of the church that never came. Now, to be clear, this person is a Brighamite, belongs to the Salt Lake City Church, and apparently so does his wife. This letter is something that must be said in hopes that you will see my position for what I believe it means to me. I love you too much to be silent. I am honest. I am honestly writing this letter for you, not to attack your beliefs. Now, I'm not going to read the whole introduction. You're welcome to go look it up and read it for yourself. I read this to Christine and asked her what she thought, and she had the exact same thought that I was thinking. Why was he going on this journey alone? Why didn't he take his wife with her? And that's exactly what I responded to the sister at, at my first glance of it. Just because he ordered the tomato soup and grilled cheese and it didn't come for him doesn't mean it's not going to come for his wife or anyone else in that particular branch of our shared faith. It also doesn't mean that God isn't real and he can't go to another restaurant. But what I really deeply want to know is, why was he on this journey alone? Why didn't he go for his wife? Why didn't he go with his wife? I will tell you point blank, every part of the journey that I had that led me to where I am spiritually right now, I shared with my wife. Probably at times whether she wanted me to or not. I say that lovingly as a joke. But she was there. She listened to my concerns. She prayed with me. We read scriptures together. We contemplated deep issues and went to the Lord together to find, questions, to find answers to questions. And they weren't always immediately received. And we had differing opinions as we were taking this journey. But we still found common ground and were able to continue moving forward. I can't imagine what it would have been like if I would have just shoved Christine to the side like she didn't matter. And just gone on this journey completely alone and come back and announce to her, Hey, I know you had no idea that I was harboring all these secret feelings and thoughts. But I'm putting you on notice. I've already worked through all of them, and here's where I am. You can catch up or not, but this is uh, me talking to you, not at you. Because that's what I heard when I read that introduction. The scriptures talk about this idea of being equally yoked, and what does that mean? Some people think it means you have to be literally the same in all, like way too many things, which I think is kind of weird. Uh, another idea is that you need to complement each other. So if one person is good at this, the other person needs to be good at that. Some people think it means that you need to have the same religion, the same, go to the same church, be the same political, what have you. What I believe equally yoked means is willing to love and accept the person you're with where you are and go on that journey with them. Not plow ahead dragging them behind you. Not sitting on the ground and refusing to move as they move forward. Does that mean that my wife and I have never fought? And that everything has always been perfect? Of course not. There's times when both of us have sat down on the ground separately, together. And there's been times when one of us has moved forward, dragging the other along separately or together. But our love keeps us united and equally yoked. Because we're always there with the other one, trying to encourage the other one along. Trying to encourage one another along. And trying our best to keep the same pace as we move forward. That's what makes our marriage work. And I, I love Christine very, very much because she's willing to put up with me. I feel the Holy Spirit telling me to share one more thing with you before I end this Thursday thought. When I was younger, I was listening to a book on tape, and I believe this is when I was working at Benedict Books. So probably 1998, maybe 99. And I'm driving home, and the book I'm listening to is telling me, to recommit to to you know, even if you you prayed on the Book of Mormon, prayed to know that the Salt Lake City Church is true, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints from Utah is true, to do it again. So I pulled off of the freeway, I parked in a parking lot, and I bowed my head right there and I said a prayer. And I asked two things: I wanted to know the Book of Mormon was true, I wanted to, to reconfirm, to know again that the Book of Mormon is true. And I also wanted to know that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was the Lord's one true church upon the earth. 
I got nothing. I felt nothing. I felt empty. I walked into the restaurant. I ordered my tomato soup and grilled cheese or grilled cheese and tomato soup. And nothing came. And this was a surprise for me because I'm a very spiritual person. Normally when I pray to the Lord, the Lord is listening, the Lord speaks back, and, and I try my best to hear what the Lord has to say. It doesn't mean I always understand, but I'm always trying to listen. So I, I felt it out. What do I do here? And I felt impressed just to pray on the Book of Mormon, and I did. And the Lord did confirm it was true <laughs> by saying, you already know this is true. There's other things you can be doing at your time. He was just kind of like, why, why are you doing this? You you know through and through that this is true. And so I was like, oh, well, I guess then that must have been why he didn't answer the prayer the first time. So I said a second prayer, asking, I, you know, I want, to, I want to be able to tell people, I prayed specifically about the Church of Jesus Christ, Lord, saying, so that I know this is the one true church upon the earth. And the Lord told me that it wasn't. I wasn't able to get the answer to the original prayer. I wasn't able to get the tomato soup and the grilled cheese, the grilled cheese and tomato soup. Just think with the analogy here. Until I prayed on them the way that the Lord wanted me to, to give me the understanding that I needed. Of course, the Book of Mormon is true. And no, this isn't the one and only true church upon the earth. And I will tell you, this is one of the times I prayed. I'm like, am I supposed to be in Community of Christ? It was the RLDS church back then. So was I, am I supposed to be in the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ, Lord of the Saints? And uh, I did some soul searching about that, and, and I wasn't. So I knew the Lord wanted me in this church, but he made it very, very clear. In, in that church, I should say. He made it very, very clear that it wasn't the one and only true church. So why do I share this with you? I'm not sharing with you to attack any church at all. I want to make that I want to make that very very clear. The reason why I'm sharing with you is because sometimes when we go to the restaurant and we look at the menu, we need to figure out how the Lord wants to speak to us. And and I want to tell you that the one part that people may ignore in that analogy is when I think of a waiter, that's someone I say, hey, I want you to go get me this food, and I'm going to tip you well to go do it. It's what you're getting paid to do, so please go get this for me, and then I'll, I'll give you a nice tip for, for going and talking to the, the cook for me, putting my, for putting my order in. But we don't have to go to a restaurant to eat. We can make food at home. We can go directly to the chef, the Lord. And yeah, there are going to be times when we do need someone there between us and the Lord in the sense that the Lord sends people to us to help move us forward. And there are times when the Lord sends us to other people to help move them forward. But as long as we are stuck in the type of restaurant, the type of church, we have to wait on the staff to do a thing for us we can't think for ourselves, then we're stuck in the church age and we're not moving to the kingdom. I have people tell me all the time, you can't accept everyone because if you do, then the bad people will still do bad things. It's like, well, they're going to do the bad things, right? Either way, whether they're in the fellowship or some other church or not. So why don't we just welcome them, the 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 physician is for the sick, not the whole. So even if I'm wrong in my beliefs, then at least I'm building that relationship with God. The grace of Jesus Christ will make the difference, and we can learn from one another and grow line upon line, precept upon precept. But when we put that barrier, we put that, that waiter or waitress there to separate us from God and to decide who gets to be in the restaurant and who doesn't, and you have someone out there saying, you have a reservation. I'm sorry, you're not wearing the right clothes. You're not doing the right things. We need to move around these people, around the church, and go straight to the kingdom of God. And that's really what my Thursday thought is today. 
This is the Thursday thought I want to leave you with. How can you improve your relationship with your friends, your family, your loved ones, and the Lord? It doesn't have to be an either-or situation like it seems to be in that letter introduction I shared with you earlier. We can go to the Lord with our families, with our friends, just like Christine and I have done. And I want to encourage you to do so. This isn't the private battle. And I want you to know that if you need if you need service, if you need a waiter or a waitress, we have people here in the fellowship that can help you find your way to the kitchen. We're not going to take your order and leave you sitting at the table waiting alone. We're not going to tell you to order harder, louder, faster, stronger, or with more faith. We're going to facilitate a relationship between you and God, not dictate it. So my Thursday thought for you is this. How are you going to come to the Lord on your own and with your spouse and with your friends and with your family? How are you going to get yourself into that kitchen? And build that personal relationship with God. That's my Thursday thought. And I'll leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.